Cities are having quite a moment. Um, with urbanization rising across the globe and many core cities in the United States growing in population faster than their surrounding regions for the first time in decades, but also because there's a growing realization that cities themselves are a social technology that drives innovation. When you bring people in close proximity together, uh, creativity flows and new things happen. You've heard this a thousand times today. And that makes it an interesting time to think about the cities we have and what makes them, what makes that capacity to foster innovation work. And also to think about how we need to physically reshape our cities. That's especially true for older cities with aging infrastructure. And how do we bridge from the cities we have now to the cities we want them to become? And how do we take full advantage of the cities uh, capacity to foster innovation as we do that. And I'm just finishing a de degree in urban planning, uh, and it's been a fantastic opportunity to think about these questions and to really deeply dive into examining the cities we have and the cities of the future. But I can assure you, the cities of the future are way more fun. Um, it's never been easier for us to create photorealistic renderings uh, reimagining the cities we have, washing away the problems they have, and having uh, sleek, um, sexy images of what our cities could become. And that makes it uh, really tempting to look past the cities we have to those future visions. And I know that from personal experience because I put off getting this degree for five years to build a 56-story skyscraper. And I had never done anything like it before. I went from doing research for a nonprofit to building a $300 million architectural landmark, the one you see with the graceful arc on the right. And it was an incredible opportunity and an incredibly invigorating project, working alongside experts in a diverse range of fields, um, architecture, engineering, interior design, sales and marketing. And we built a lavish sales center, complete with a full model home, to make it supremely easy for you to imagine living in the skyline. Unfortunately, in the end, imagining that life was all that came of that project because it was never built. Thousands of hours and millions of dollars went to a building of paper and pixels. And meanwhile, that entire time, this old shabby building on the building site sat vacant. It's standard procedure. We thought the demolition was gonna happen in just a couple of months, so we cleared the tenants out. And that meant that the most tangible um, effect that we had on the fabric of the city by undertaking this huge ambitious endeavor was that there was this energy vacuum in the middle of downtown. That experience sensitized me to the fact that um, we all know there's been a lot of vacant space in our communities over the past few years with the downturn in the economy, but a lot of that vacancy is for the sake of progress. Vacancy as we try to build the cities of the future. You see this all around town. You can see boarded up buildings with a rendering on them saying, this might be built here someday. You see fenced off areas with a sleek building and you're thinking, okay, this might be built here. And on a much larger scale, when commercial streets are reconstructed. That is a huge disruption to the businesses and the residents in those neighborhoods along those corridors. Um, and the standard theory is that, well, it'll be a disruption during that process, but then they'll, they'll be in the position to benefit once it's done. And let's just call it even. But in effect, um, vacancy has kind of a downward spiral um, aspect to it because vacancy deters customers from visiting adjacent businesses. And then these entire districts, these entire areas of our city can become energy vacuum. And their energy and vitality can be ebbing just as a big project like a road reconstruction will be ending. I know you know that there is a light rail line being built between Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, the 
first hint might have been the fact that the street outside is torn up. And a group of planning and design students, uh, a group of us here at the university, have been thinking about this, have been thinking about how we build our cities of the future and how we kind of work against the, our ability to foster vitality when that project is completed. And in looking at this $1 billion infrastructure project that it's going to connect our two uh, core cities, we started focusing in on the vacant storefronts. And there are plenty of them. Um, about a quarter of them are vacant right now. And that might get you to thinking, okay, so what is, why should we have any interest in old shabby buildings? Um, what is their social utility? It would be fun to come up here and say, I know, this, I know the, the best social technology, and it's something you've never heard of, and it's gonna blow your mind. I'm here to say that arguably one of the best social technologies we have to foster vitality in our communities are old storefronts, old buildings, for the simple reason that they are cheap and they're affordable. And Jane Jacobs said this 40 years ago, new ideas need old buildings. And there's this dynamic that we're familiar with where people develop ideas for businesses and projects in their home office or their garage, and then the next logical place for them to go is cheap, available commercial space. And we've seen, we can see how this has worked in the past on, in places like University Avenue. This storefront here is vacant, and it's been vacant for a while, and it's old and shabby now, and it was an old and shabby 25 years ago, but that made it the best place for someone to open the first new brewery in the Twin Cities since Prohibition, and that worked out pretty well. Just a couple blocks away, this storefront, very similar story. Vacant, old, shabby, and it was old and shabby uh, 20 years ago, and that made it the ideal location when you're trying to move an upstart senatorial candidacy from your campaign manager's home office into the public eye when you're being outspent seven to one and you want a chance to win. He did win. The group of us who have been working on this problem uh, started digging in to examining the possibilities of what you can do with vacant storefronts. And the first thing that we saw was there are a lot of pop-up storefront projects, pop-up storefronts, around the globe. And they tend to be one-off projects where someone with a, an amazing amount of moxie just goes out and says, I'll give you a little bit of money and I'm gonna do something cool in your space. There have been enough of those kinds of projects that community development uh, groups have taken note and they're starting to develop pop-up storefront initiatives. Trying to think of a way that we can turn this occasional cool thing that happens into something that will drive community and economic development. Many of those models um, are based on something like the following. You pick a small number of storefronts, maybe six, and you have a contest to see who has good ideas and you pick what the good ideas are and then you give them a lot of money to, to do their thing in that space. And that's great, but as you can expect, a, a motley group of grad students does not have $10,000 uh, to give to anyone who wants a vacant storefront. So instead, we started thinking about what would be a project model we could use that we could actually implement and that could be a stepping stone towards making these spaces available to short-term tenants. And we launched a project called Starling. And Starling uh, was kind of a counterintuitive pick for the name because Starlings are uh, nasty birds. I just got a house uh, and we put up a bird feeder and they have been eating all of my bird seed. So there's a real irony here. The reason why we chose the name Starling is because they use existing nests and they're very aggressive in going after those nests. So while it might have been more pleasant and poetic to name our project after those birds in Africa that are on the hippo's backs in a total symbiotic relationship with our surroundings, um, we knew that in order to create this field of opportunity, we needed to be opportunistic in the best sense of the word. So um, we, we didn't know anything to start. We went out, we formed relationships with community groups who were working along the corridor. Um, and we started 
promoting the opportunity. We launched the project six months ago, and we just said, there's something here. If we want this project to, project to succeed, if we want this light rail infrastructure project to succeed, then there's an opportunity here for us to drive vitality to this neighborhood during construction so that when it's finished, the communities are thriving already and you don't need to start at a deficit. We're still learning. Um, the good news is it's going to work. I really believe that. It's going to work and it worked to such an extent that it completely overwhelmed us to start. We launched the project and we received a flood of inquiries from people who said, I'm starting a business, I have an art project, I have a theater company, I have a community group, and we need space, and we would love to take a month-to-month -month term in a storefront on University Avenue, both because it's an affordable opportunity and because it's a way for us to mobilize our own vitality to support the vitality of our community. So there are two main ways that this is taking shape. One is we are going out and cataloging all the vacant space on University Avenue and cocktail contacting the property owners and asking them if they would be willing to entertain offers for temporary use of their space. And if you remember the old brewery, here it is, uh, and it is going to be a pop-up theater. The other way that we're working is with community groups who have a specific vision for their neighborhood and how they want it to change with the physical change that's happening to their community. And working in a more focused way to guide specific uses to their spaces. So in this instance, the community group is leasing the space and they're renting it out by the week to members of their community who want to use it for whatever they want to do. So I've used all my time, but I've really uh, enjoyed this opportunity to tell you about the opportunity we see to foster meanwhile use of these vacant storefronts and the asset they can be in driving our community's vitality. Thank you.